Hey everybody, Bill Sky, the C++ guy, back again for th the third of four videos on loops in C and C++. Now the while loop, the do while loop, and this loop, the for loop, are all compatible with the C language, so this goes with both languages, no problem. The next one after this will be a range-based for loop, and we might actually do that later on down the line a little bit. But that is a loop that is only for C++. It's a common loop in Python. But today what we're going to do is we're going to do the standard, what I like to call the counting for loop. Now a for loop has three parts to it. Inside of the condition, it's got an initialization part, it's got a condition part, and then it's got an update part. And I'm going to show you that inside of code. We don't have to go through a presentation or anything like that. It should make it pretty easy to understand, so let's take a look. So I've got a brand new project running right here, created right here. And the reason is, is because for loops do not really lend themselves very well to menus and user input. It's mainly used for processing arrays, which we haven't talked about yet, but it's coming up very shortly. But um, it, it's good for counting, doing a, the loop increment 10 times, 20 times, 5 million times, whatever it takes. And as I said earlier, the for loop has three parts to it. You say for parentheses, and then you do the initialization, the continue condition, notice the semicolons, and then you have an update portion. And then you have the contents of the loop. Now you don't actually put these words initialization, continue condition, and update in there. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually comment this out and we're going to follow it as a template. So I'm going to say for. So the initialization is that you have to initialize something. In this case we're going to initialize a counter. So I'm going to say unsigned int i equals zero. So i will be our counter. We're going to start it at zero. Now i is now only available inside of the loop. It is not available outside of the loop. It's only available inside of the loop. And the reason is, is because we initialized it in the loop parentheses. So it's part of the loop only. So the scope is only within the loop. It's not available outside the loop. So that's the initialization part. The continue condition, I'm going to say something like as long as i is less than 1,000. Right, let's make it 10 for now, just so it's easy to see. So that means that the for loop will keep going as long as i is less than 10. Now right now when the loop starts, i will be equal to 0, so i will be less than 10. 0 is less than 10, so the inside portion of the loop will then be executed. And then we have the update, so we're going to increment i. Now if you remember, when we talked about math on, in, in C++ uh, in previous videos, i++ means increment i by 1. I also could have said plus equals 1. Or I could have said i equals i plus 1. It doesn't matter. They all do the same thing. But the standard is simply to increment it i plus plus. And then we open up the loop, and now we have the contents of the loop. So we're going to make this very simple. I'm simply going to say c out i uh, value of i is i. And that'll be that's all we're going to do for the loop. So let's go ahead and save and build this. And let's run it. And you can see the loop executed 10 times. Now you might say, wait a minute, i is equal to 9 at the bottom. Why? That's not 10 times. Yes, it is because i started at 0. Now if we wanted to, we could have made i equal to 1 but then you have to say less than or equal to 10. So now the loop will go 1 to 10. It's always good to play around with this stuff. There we go, 1 to 10. So the loop did execute 10 times. The pretty much the normal way of doing things though is 0 less than 10. And the reason is, is because when we get to it, arrays start at 0. So they don't start at 1, they start at 0 in C and C++. So the loop starting at 0 always seems to be a a common way of using counting for loops. 
Now, some of you may also ask, why did I put unsigned in front there? Well, because this is, well, this might not be an unsigned number, but a, a loop almost never goes into negative territory. It almost never has a counter which is a negative value. Now, that could be wrong. In some situations, you might want to have a negative counter in the loop, but in general, they always start at zero. And they always stay positive, so we make it unsigned. And for data structures like vectors, that's actually really important because if you're going to be integrate iterating through a vector, which is the same as an array, which is a whole bunch of data all ne right next to each other, you want that to be unsigned. You're never going to want that to be signed. So I always say unsigned int i. Also, by making it unsigned, you can go up to f over 4 billion. If you just leave out the unsigned and say int, you can only count up to 2 billion. And you might say to yourself, well, I'm never going to count up to 4 billion. Eh, yes, you will. There's some, Something's going to happen where you're going to have to count up pretty big. And so by making it unsigned, uh, you can make that range larger. Now, now, this was incrementing. We can also do a for loop that decrement. So we're going to make our, our i equal to 10. As long as i is greater than 0, we're going to subtract. So you can also decrement. And I'm just going to say count. I'm just going to copy that. And let's save and build it. So let's take a look. So it started at 0. It counted up to 9. But then the second loop began, i was equal to 10, because that's how we set it up in here in the initialization portion. As long as i was greater than 0, keep going. So it printed 10. It then decremented i. It printed 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. So let's take a little bit closer look at these loops. Now, it's always a good idea, testing decrementing loop. And I'm going to go here and type this up here, testing incrementing. So make it look a little bit better. Let's save and build it and run it. And so the output looks a little bit better. OK, so let's take a little let's take a closer look at this at, the, at our first loop. So what happens is when the after the program prints the C out on line 18, it sees this for loop and it says, OK, I'm going to initialize a variable called i. It's going to be an unsigned integer. I'm going to make it equal to 0. The loop never does that again. It only happens the very first time the loop is approached or is executed by the compiler. The very next thing that it does is it asks the question, is i less than 10? Well, 0 is less than 10. So it says, OK, I'm going to do the contents of the loop. When the bottom, when the close brace of the loop is encountered, it says, OK, I, I want to increment or I want to go and do the loop again, but I have to update i first. So it's going to update i by saying i plus plus. So i is now equal to 1. As I said earlier, it's never going to redo the initialization, so it's always going to then do the condition. So i is now equal to 1. Is 1 less than 10? Yes, it is. So it, it executes the contents of the loop. When it gets to the bottom of the loop, it, it in increments. It does the update portion of the loop. It increments it by 1. So i is now equal to 2. Again, it never does the initialization again. So is 2 less than 10? Yes, it is. And it goes through and continues until i is no longer less than 10. So the moment that i becomes 10, the loop ends and it doesn't execute anymore. And you can pretty much do the same thing over here on the decrementing loop. Now, watch what happens if I try to see out the value of i from outside the loop. And I save and build that. The compiler says, I don't know what i is, because i was defined inside the loop. So if you need to check to see how many times a loop executed, you can't do it this way because the counter is inside of the loop. So to fix that problem, what we could do is we could put the counter up here. So we can define it outside the loop, and then we just get rid of the initialization 
here and here. And now it will compile because the scope of the of the integer, the unsigned integer i, it is now in main, which means the for loop can see it, the other for loop can see it, and we can also see it here. So it's not just defined inside of the loop. Now, why would you do that? Well, maybe you want to know how many times. Maybe there's a question here. Maybe you said if i is less than five. I want to continue the loop, else I want to break out of the loop. And so the moment that i becomes not less than 5, as soon as it becomes 5, the loop's going to break and you're going to output i, which is going to be 5. So you can do all kinds of things inside of a loop. You can have multiple lines of code, you can have user input. Um, maybe you might want to do a loop that counts up, let, that, that sums up some numbers. So let's actually do that. So I'm going to create a double called the, sum, the double sum. I'm going to make that equal to zero. And what I'm going to, now let me clean up this code a little bit and we're going to do another loop down here. Okay, so I'm going to create a loop. I'm going to say couch user input loop. I'm going to say for int unsigned int i equals 0, i less than 5, i plus plus. And we're going to put some code in there. Now, what this code is going to do is it's going to ask the user to type a number. And every time I type a number, it's going to add that to my the double sum. Now, you might look at this and say, well, wait a minute. Isn't i already defined inside of the main program? You're absolutely right. But this is going to be a different i. This is going to be the i that is defined inside the for loop. So it's basically going to overrule the i that was defined in the main. Now, that can be confusing. It's not a good idea to do that. I'm doing it here just to show you the contrast. I always like to make my variables different values. So if I want to, I can make this J. I can make it Fred if I want. I can make it Kathy. Okay, I can make that variable any value I want. All right, so let's, now I, I always like to have that clear pin in there. So let's get that puppy in there. Because every time I enter I use cn to enter a numeric value. I want to clear the buffer just to protect the user. OK, it built well. Now I'm getting a warning that I've never used this. That's fine. Well, I'm about to use it. OK, so let's say count or see out. Please enter a double value. And I'm going to can into user double input. Now I haven't defined that number yet, so let's do it. And let's clear kin there. Okay. So user double input. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say double user double input. I really don't need the dot zero zero, but I do it anyway. All right, so there's my user double input. I'm going to say, uh, what was the name of our sum? It was the double sum. So let's copy. Whoop, I copied everything. So let's copy that. OK, double sum plus equals user double input. So this is going to execute five times. And I'm going to come down here and I'm going to say count the total you entered is double sum. I'm going to say count. The average is the double sum divided by 5. Now why did I divide it by 5? Because I had 5 right here. 
So that's the number of times I entered in data. All right, let's see how this works. Okay, please enter a double value. I'm going to say 11.11, 12.12, 13.13, 14.14, 16.16, 17.17, 18.18, 19.19, 20.20, 21.21, 22.22, 23.23, 24.24, 25.25, 26.26, 27.27, 28.28, 29.29, 30.30, 31.31, 32.32, 33.33, 34.33, 35.33, 36.33, Okay, so the total you enter was 65.65, makes complete sense. And the average is that divided by 5, which is 13.13. .13. However, what if I wanted to put in here negative 999 to exit? What if the user, I give the user even more capabilities to say maybe they don't want to enter in five values. Maybe they just want to enter in one. Maybe they want to enter in two. So I'm going to have them input it, and I'm going to say if user double input is less than or is equal to negative 999, and it's always good to put, des put the decimal when you're comparing floating point numbers, I'm going to break, else I'm going to go ahead and do this addition. And let's go ahead and put our comments in. Okay, so let's run this. And now the user has the option of typing negative 999 to exit. So I'm gonna type in 12.12, .12, and I'm gonna type in negative 999. So the program ended. Now, it's I don't have a program ending, have a nice day, so I'm not actually sure that the program did go all the way to end. I'm assuming that. Well, we have a problem though. The sum is correct. 12.12 .12 is correct. We did enter 12.12. .12. Notice that it didn't add negative 999 because we broke out of the loop before we did the addition. The addition is in the L's. However, our average is messed up. Oops. We don't want to divide by I, or I'm sorry, by 5. We want to divide by J. But there's a problem. And I'm sure some of you can tell what that problem is. J was defined inside of the for loop. So it's not available outside of the for loop. But this is one place where you could actually use it. So I'm going to come up here and I'm going to say unsign int j equals 0. So I'm going to make put j outside of the loop. And then I'm going to get rid of the initialization or the instantiation of the j variable. And let's see what happens now. 12.12, .12, negative 999. Looks good. So the average is 12.12. .12. So this is a good use of, or a good example of why you might stick the counting variable outside of the for loop, is that if you need that value later on for some type of a calculation. Now we still have some problems here. Um, let me run this and I'll show you what the problem is. If I type negative 999 immediately, we get this strange thing called a NAN. So what it did was it gave us a zero. Now on Windows, I've actually seen this destroy the program. The program just dies. You never get to program ending, have a nice day. However, on Linux, the compiler is pretty good. And the C++ runtime is pretty good. It's saying that I divided by zero. What? I divided by zero. What does that mean? Well, remember, I, j was equal to 0 at the beginning of my program. I typed negative 999, which meant I left the loop. I never incremented it. So j is equal to 0. I'm dividing by 0. <gasps> Bad idea. Nan means not a number. So we might want to make some changes to this. We might want to say something like if j is equal to 0, out no sum or average is available. Else, we'll go ahead and do the calculation. So you want to protect the user from them doing something that isn't too kosher. And let's see what happens now. All right, let's just put in negative 999. And no summer average is available because the user didn't type anything. It didn't didn't type anything in. They just they typed in negative nine nine nine. 
So that is a for loop. It is a counting loop. It can also be used in other ways, which we'll see as this course continues. But for right now is an introduction to loops or for loops, counting loops. It's really, really useful. You need this information for when we actually start talking about arrays, which is coming up pretty soon. I hope to see you at the next video.